Daniel McCann. We welcome our visitors, uh, our those who are joining us on our recorded service, and a special welcome to all the little ones in the balcony that will be singing later in the service, after the Passion History reading and before my devotion. The theme for our uh, Wednesday Lent devotions is God on Trial. And just an intro paragraph. The unbelieving world has always insisted on putting God on trial. As our society becomes more secular, we Christians are increasingly aware of the many ways in which God and his people are judged. Temptations are many in this environment, treating unbelievers as enemies, retreating from the world, even questioning God ourselves. How do we live as people of God in this hostile world? We find our model and our motivation in Jesus. This series, God on Trial, takes us back to the moments when God was literally on trial before humankind in the person of Jesus Christ. In these inspired episodes, we find forgiveness for us and all people, love for our enemies, strength for our faith, and courage to testify to the truth. And this afternoon, love on trial, sympathy. What does sympathy mean? When we feel that the world is against us, it's easy to feel sorry for ourselves, self-pity, sympathy. We make ourselves the victims and wallow in our trouble. But Jesus refused to do that. Rather, he felt compassion for those who knew he would suffer after him and even forgave those crucifying him. Likewise, rather than pitying ourselves, we feel pity for those who have no idea the destruction that awaits them and want them to know the Father's forgiveness. May God be praised and may we be blessed. Uh, here at Emmanuel, we follow the service uh, that begins in the front of our hymnal, Compline on 246. So please take the blue hymnal and turn it to page 246. We read the response of verses. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night. Night and peace of the Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name all the time, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. And that brings us to our first hymn, uh, hymn number 712.
service continues with the confession of sins and announcement of forgiveness again on page 246 in the hymnal. We confess our sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, and in all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver and restore us that we may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ. And in Him we are forgiven. Let us rest in His peace until the rising of the sun, when we shall serve Him in newness of life. Amen. Amen. Our psalm for, for today is uh, Psalm 138. Again, you'll find that in front of our hymnal on page uh, 138. We join in singing, Your praises, God, I'm bringing you. Psalm 138.
invite you now to take the bulletin and to join me in reading responsibly Passion Reading number six. It's on the first page, the bottom of the first page in the bulletin. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. They said to one another, This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, so this is what the soldiers did. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build the holy priest, save yourself from the mountain from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, but he can't save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants to. For the last I am the Son of God. One of the criminals who hung there. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. He said, Don't you fear God, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to his disciple, Here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Some of those standing near heard this. They said, Listen, Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on the stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it up to Jesus' lips. When he had received a drink, Jesus said, it is finished. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs. And after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts. And Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many, many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. Here ends our Passion History reading. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, 
And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wound, we are healed. And now the kids uh, will sing their song, Oh, how he loves you and me. loses 
her job for refusing to go along with immoral or unethical behavior. Students and teachers are targeted by a shooter because they are Christians. And there are many stories like these. You may have one of your own. And we haven't yet mentioned the funny looks, the cruel comments, the cold shoulders we get from unbelievers all the time. Oh, we are such poor Christians. But should we look for pity? We won't get it from the unbelieving world. Many people are happy to see Christian Christianity fading. Glad to see us Christians finally put in our place. Poor Christians? Is that what we should say? Is that what Jesus would say? Jesus sure makes for a sympathetic, sympathetic figure in our Passion History reading or here in our devotional text. His on the way out to Golgotha where he was crucified. Actually, pathetic might be a better word than just sympathy. His back is shredded from the whippings, his face bruised purple from the beatings that he's taken from the Jewish leaders, Herod and Pilate. And of course, the crown of, the, the crown of thorns and blood drips from his head. After a night of sleep, without sleep, with constant abuse, Jesus is exhausted. His body crumbles under the weight of the cross. And so, as we learn, the soldiers order someone else from the crowd to carry it. No wonder the women mourned and wailed. This group of people following behind Jesus may have been believers, or simply citizens of Jerusalem drawn to the crowd and following the morning's events, who then burst into tears at the sight of a human being treated so beautifully. So brutally. What does Jesus say? Don't cry for me. No sympathy for me, please. Mourn for yourselves and for your children. In fact, just five days earlier, Jesus himself had wept for the people of Jerusalem because they rejected the promised Savior. They would experience God's judgment. The time was coming when mothers would rather be childless than to have to watch their children suffer and die. People would prefer to be crushed to death by a mountain than to be starved, tortured, or captured by their enemies. And history records the horrific things that happened to mothers and children uh, a generation later when the Roman army destroyed Jerusalem uh, in 70 AD, things that are too terrible to describe in a devotion. Jesus uses this parable uh, in our reading. If people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? He seems to be saying that if he, the innocent one, was tortured and put to death, how much more properly could the sinful inhabitants of Jerusalem expect to suffer and die? Maybe we could turn this toward ourselves. If Jesus, the perfect Son of God, was put on trial and suffered, why would we sinners be surprised when the same thing happens to us? When we hear about the decline of Christianity in this country, when we read about society moving away from godly values, or when we feel the sting of rejection or mockery ourselves, our natural reaction is to think of ourselves as victims and ask for sympathy. But that reveals a problem of how we view these things. If you look at the big picture, what we experience now is nothing like what Christians around the world suffer, and nothing like what Christians throughout the ages have endured. The comfort that we Christians have enjoyed in this country for generations is not the norm. More importantly, the woe is me mentality is simply self-centered. It leads us to complain, to lash out, to circle the wagons, to try to keep the world at bay, to give up, to look to flawed human leaders and systems, to recover what we think we've lost. When did God ever tell us to play the victim? Self-pity is the opposite of what we see in Jesus. His pity is not for himself, but for the women, their children, and husbands, and all their countrymen who would suffer so. 
course, that's not the full extent of his pity. Follow his stumbling footsteps to the cross and watch him be lifted up on a cross like a criminal. And what are Jesus' first words that he spoke from the cross? Father, forgive them. Forgive who? His disciples? Those poor women? No, the soldiers driving nails through his hands and feet. Jesus' words reveal a heart that is focused not on self, but on others. He was thinking about the people of Israel. He was thinking about the soldiers who had no idea they were crucifying the Son of God. And yes, he was thinking about you and me today. If Jesus had pitied himself, he easily could have escaped this fate. But he was pitying us, poor sinners, who were facing a deserved and eternal destruction, far worse than anything the Romans could give out. We deserve to face God's anger on the last day with no mountain in sight to cover us. But, dear friends, Jesus had sympathy for us. Think about that for a moment. Jesus' heart went out to you. But he didn't just weep for you. He took God's punishment for you. He died for you. He shed his precious blood on the cross to cover you, to hide you from the destruction to come. Through pain and fatigue and insult, you were on Jesus' mind. To say that Jesus didn't want sympathy for himself isn't to say that he didn't deserve sympathy, that his suffering wasn't so bad. That should be obvious. There's a reason those women were moved to tears at the simple sight of Jesus. This young man could carry a beam of wood, tells you what he had already endured. His torture was only the beginning. And to say that Jesus doesn't feel for some people isn't to say that he doesn't have pity on us. Again, nothing could be farther from the truth. Jesus knows our pain. He felt it. He can sympathize with our weakness. His heart still goes out to us when we suffer including and especially when we suffer as Christians for his name. But he doesn't want us to wallow in self-pity. He wants us to look past ourselves and look to him. Let him help us carry our crosses in life as we follow him and find strength in his word and sacraments. He wants us to look past ourselves and have pity on those around us. We have brothers and sisters in the faith who are struggling with pain and temptation. We have fellow followers of Jesus who are feeling the attacks of anti-Christian forces in this world, many of them feeling very much alone. Our Savior would have us pray for them, reach out to them, and remind them of His promises. Jesus also would have us direct our sympathy even toward our enemies. There is a destruction coming that this world cannot fathom. Infinitely worse than the horrors that took place in 70 AD in Jerusalem. And the people of this world, even the ones who make our lives hard as Christians, don't know it's coming. Many of those who put God on trial are like the soldiers crucifying Jesus. They have no idea what they're doing. They think they're fighting against outdated values or old-fashioned fairy tales, fighting for the rights of humans to live free as they wish. They don't realize they're fighting against God, and they have no idea how badly that fight will end for them. What if we thought of these people not as enemies or obstacles, but as fellow citizens, fellow sinners who have been so tricked by Satan's lies that they are doing his bidding without realizing it? We can have pity on them. We can warn them, pray for them, and tell them about God's forgiveness, just like Jesus did. We can point them to the Savior, whose compassion knows no limit. In other words, let's save sympathy for others. We poor Christians? Is that what we should say? What would Jesus say? We know the answer because he told us in a sermon on a different mountain three years earlier. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Unless we are happy to suffer with Jesus. When the world treats us like it treated him, we're reminded that the Father sees us like he sees his Son, righteous and royal. Pity? Why? We have forgiveness, life, and salvation in Jesus Christ. The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Our service continues with our next hymn, and that's hymn 425. And we'll just sing the first three of the four verses, Go to Dark Gethsemane, uh, hymn 425. According to your word, 
For thy eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for every people, a light to light the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. Amen. We close our service with our last hymn, hymn number 433. Thank you.